Hello everyone, welcome. This is day three of the retreat. We are following a retreat that Father Jerome Bertram of the Oxford Oratory gave in the 1980s to um, the Carmelite Nines of Chichester. And he based those retreats, those um, spiritual exercises, uh, on his pilgrimage to uh, Compostela. All the uh, joys and all the difficulties that they had and uh, during the, uh, the walk, during the journey. And uh, so he uses those experiences to then talk about the spiritual life, the joys and the sorrows. Um, Father Jerome, I think I need to tell you again, he's deceased now, but uh, I was particularly fond of him because he was the editor of my translations of the Spanish mystics into English, and um, he, was, uh, he was very nice, and uh, he <laughs> I remember I remember how I used to just do my best because I was translating into not my natural native language and that's even more difficult and uh, so I would go through first draft, second, third, tenth, whatever and <laughs> when I thought it was okay, so this is okay, you know, I would give it to him and he always told me that uh, very good, very good, but he would he would clean it up obviously and so I needed not only because of the language but I also since it was mystical theology I needed someone who I needed a theologian I needed uh, someone who knew um, what the issues discussed were because one wrong word in theology you can create havoc you know but he was a very very nice approachable and very funny, a very amusing guy. He told me a story once of very learned, erudite. He translated from classical Greek the the the, uh, the writings of the classics from Latin. Highly uh, learned man. He told me once of uh, an experience he had in Greece. Um, of course, he knew classical Greek, but uh, you know, I suppose that Greek has evolved and it has changed. You know, but uh, Latin hasn't because no one uses it anymore. But uh, uh, anyway, he he was in Greece and uh, wanted to visit the monuments and this and that, and he hired a car, uh, a very old car, and it broke down. It broke down in the middle of two villages, so he had to walk all the way to the to the next village and um, the first thing he found was a tavern there full of men and uh, okay you know so he went in and uh, he explained in the best Greek he had which was classical Greek he said he explained the situation his car had broken down and uh, would anyone be so kind to give him a hand whatever and the reaction was that everyone burst out laughing, just laughing. And he thought, okay, uh, what have I said? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm still laughing about it. And he told me this 30 years ago, 20 years ago. He said what happened was that for the word car, they understood pretty much you know everything else what he was saying but for the word car he used the word chariot <laughs> so he in fact he said my chariot has broken down well you can imagine the laughter anyway so uh, this is father jerome giving this retreat these talks to catholic nuns okay cloistered nuns at that and uh, this is day three, okay, so loss and gain. He didn't have a good time walking all, all about Spain at the time. Some of the things that he, he says um, a little strange to me, but I don't know whether they changed since then, but anyway, okay, let's go. 
In Spain, it appears, the rain stays exclusively on the mountains. It began as we reached the Pyrenees. They were not very high at the point where we crossed them, but still quite a barrier to cross. Not really high enough to look pretty, either. There were neither snow-capped peaks nor glaciers, but just a rather bleak-looking range of very steep hills. And then came the rain. The route led us up the haunted pass of Roncevaux in France. We had to come halfway up as the thunder rumbled vaguely around in the distance and there was a general uncertainty in the air as to whether it was going to start raining seriously or not. Then, in the middle of the night, we were woken by the sound of galloping horses. We saw nothing, we, but we heard them sounding as if they were coming right through the camp. Were we about to be trampled on? What was the meaning of these heavy cavalry horses pounding up the pass, the sound of a horn blowing in the distance? The next day was grey, drizzly, the sort of misty day when you can't see more than a few yards in front of you. The way was well marked but, uh, but tedious. Water began to trickle down the path. Then it eventually trickled into our boots, into our rucksacks. Plodding up the hills, we were beginning to think that the pilgrimage was not such a good idea after all. At the top we found the Spanish border, which only meant that the path stopped being well, so well marked and there was a line of sheep wired to stop Spanish sheep straying into France or the other way round. There was no sign of anybody trying to stop us, check our passports or ask how many sheep we were hoping to smuggle across. We skipped over the little wire and wandered on across a rather bleak, windswept, rain-soaked, misty summit until eventually we came to a ridge and there the sun broke through. We found we were right at the crest of the pass and just below us on the Spanish side the sun was glistening on the tin roof of the great abbey of Ronces Valles. So we came merrily down the path into the abbey and where we found the community sorely windled. The buildings are vast. There must be room for 80 monks. Well, canons, regular to be precise, but in fact there are only three. They made us very much welcome and offered us a choice of wing to sleeping, plenty of hot water, food, shelter and we concelebrated Mass with them. It appeared that being on pilgrimage wasn't really so bad after all. In the evening we talked to some students coming the other way from Spain. I remember they asked one of us to explain why on earth we were doing this and he said it's always worthwhile doing something a little bit difficult for God and we nodded to ourselves at what he had said wasn't that marvellous? We had done something difficult for God and we've come over this wept, windswept hill and here we are. Isn't pilgrimage such a good thing to be doing? The rains come in every Christian life, don't they? Unexpectedly, just when we think everything is going so well, in the new fervor of our conversion, suddenly, unaccountably, everything seems to go wrong. And we find that the joy has disappeared from our Christian life. It can be very puzzling if we've become accustomed to our time of fervor, however long or short it has been. For some people it is all five hours, while others keep it up for a year or so, but sooner or later the period of a convert's fervor 
or a novice's joy expires. And we are left wondering, what have we done wrong? Why has the Lord done this to us? Why has he suddenly hidden himself? We can get quite frustrated as we find that the things of God no longer please us. The Mass, once such, such a joy, begins to become extremely irritating. This is when we notice the variations in the liturgy. We feel particularly vexed that it's no longer the way we were used to. Things are being changed. A new priest turns up and decides to do things his way. And as we get more and more irritated, we find that we spend the entire Mass saying, if only he would do it that way instead of this way. If only we were still allowed to do the other thing, or if only we could change this into that. The Mass becomes one long series of distractions. If we are nuns, we are tempted to envy those in the world outside who at least have the freedom to choose where to go for Mass. But if we are already in the world outside, our delusion is to wander from church to church trying to find a priest who will do the Mass precisely the way we want, and strangely we never seem to find him. As for us priests, we spend our time longing to have the courage to change something or racked with anger at the parishioners or bishops who frustrate our efforts to perform the perfect liturgy. It goes on, till in the end attending Mass is something no longer to look forward to, but something to dread. That sinking feeling on a Sunday morning, oh dear, I've got to go to Mass. The lovely feeling on a weekday morning, there is no obligation to go to Mass today. <laughs> then we feel there is no need to get there too early. I'll just arrive in time for the Gospel. Perhaps I'll arrive after the collection. <laughs> the feeling of, let's put it off as long as possible. I can't cope with Mass in the morning. I'll go in the evening. And then the Mass itself is just one series of irritations after another. It's the same with prayer, the same with the office. We try to say the office, but suddenly we realize quite how long and boring some of the psalms are. Or we discover that some of the psalms have been vulgarized, bits have been missed out, which might shock our modern susceptibilities, and we start getting annoyed at that. Then we decide that really the antiphons are too irritating for words and some of them really don't make sense at all. And as for the intercessions, they're impossible. So the office as well becomes something to dread. Then if there is an extra bit added on or if it's going more slowly than usual, we wonder what's all this for? I'm not enjoying this at all. I don't look forward to it, and I certainly don't find pleasure, pleasure in reciting it. Private prayer also. Somehow God hides himself, and we come to our private prayer thinking, I remember when I was first professed, prayer was so easy, and it isn't now. I put myself in the presence of God and 10 minutes later I realize that I've worked out the whole program for next week and precisely how to cook the next meal. And I haven't started to be in the presence of God. And so we try again and we go on and on till at the end of it. We realize that we haven't spent any time at all actually attending to God. It's just being a very boring period of not very constructive thought. There must be some way of getting through to God. He must be there somewhere. Now, yes, if for lunch we have baked potatoes and if we have some celery, there is a bit of fish left over. Yes, Lord, I really do want to attend to you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Um, 
been here 10 minutes. How much longer do you want me to be here, Lord? There is nothing to hold our concentration. So then we think, well, perhaps at least I can pray for other people. And we wonder fretfully, who is there that you want me to pray for? Mrs. So-and-so, isn't she a bore? Yes, Lord, I really do want to pray. Yes, I do, Lord. Just really another minute gone. Why has the joy disappeared? Why is it that after we have been given all that glorious fervor, all that grace, we don't seem to be getting anywhere? We are doing things exactly the same way as we did before. We go into the chapel, we use the rosary, perhaps a book to start us off, putting ourselves in the presence of God. What does that mean? And you here all the time, Lord? It certainly doesn't seem as if you are. And yet there was a time when we knew precisely what we meant by the presence of God. Then, of course, we begin to wonder what is the point of all of this. Here I am, wasting half an hour just sitting or kneeling, looking at my watch, wondering when on earth this is going to end. I'm really wasting my time on prayer, aren't I, Lord? I'd be much more useful if I went and did something practical. How about if I went to do some visiting for the SBP? And then we realize that we don't really want to visit these dreadful old people anyway. I mean, there is that sort of gypsy family encamped at the other end of the parish. I know that I did say that I'd go in and bring them some medicines and read to the children, but really, Lord, it's awfully boring doing that. They don't really want me, Lord, do they? Our Paris visiting, is it really worthwhile? I'm sure it's only an interruption to them. They're awfully embarrassed when I call. Wouldn't it be much better if I just stayed behind and prayed for them or... I've just remember I can't pray either. Well, whatever I do, Lord, there must be something you can do if you are there at all. All the joy seems to have gone out of Christian work as well. The joy of caring for the church, caring for the altar. There was a time when you really enjoyed ironing purificators, so sewing lace on two. Owls. Now it seems totally pointless, futile. Why can't we use paper purificators anyway? There was a time when we really enjoyed writing letters to lonely people, when we really enjoyed cooking meals for those who couldn't look after themselves, a time when we really enjoyed visiting the hospital, going from bed to bed, spreading radiance as we went. Now we feel dreadfully embarrassed. No, these people don't want to see me, Lord. The whole of our Christian life, our prayer, our good works, everything seems pointless. At this stage, of course, we look with extreme irritation at those people who are still in the fervor of their first conversion, thinking how dreadfully smug they are. How on earth can they be kneeling there quietly praying when I can't? Surely they know by now that prayer doesn't work. We go on like this for a period, getting thoroughly irritable, thoroughly frustrated by everybody else, and then all at once the sun comes through again. We suddenly recognize the experience that St. Ignatius, Ignatius had. All right, we dread going to Mass and we don't enjoy being at Mass, but we do feel marvelous when it is all over. We dread visiting the hospital and we feel terribly embarrassed when actually talking to people who are sick. But when we come out of the hospital, we have this glorious sense of well-being. After a bit, even we realize that 
even though we aren't looking forward to our Christian activity and we don't enjoy it at all while we are doing it, we do feel very good indeed after it's over. We understand, as Saint Ignatius understood, that this is one of the ways we can tell the will of the Lord. Sin is something that we look forward to, to doing and feel bad after, about afterwards. Let me say that again. Sin is something that we look forward to doing and feel bad about afterwards. Whereas a good action is something that we sometimes dread doing but feel good about afterwards. Feel good about afterwards. This is the way the Holy Spirit speaks to us to confirm in us that it has truly been worthwhile. And when that gleam of sun sunlight breaks into our world, then suddenly it all begins to make sense. We remember that we were always promised that it would be a way of the cross. We were always told that there would be a sword of sorrow. Aren't we marvelous we've actually endured all that for Christ? And so the joy comes back into our lives when we realize that all this incredibly boring, dull, dry prayer is actually something given to God. We've not gone into it for the sake of the pleasure we get out of it. We've gone into it really for the love of God and nothing else. We can take comfort in that. We can say to ourselves afterwards, yes, I did stick out my half hour there and even if I did look at my watch from time to time, I stuck to it. And now I can see that the grace of God is working throughout the rest of the day. And yes, I did find the way Father said Mass extremely irritating, but the grace of the sacrament doesn't depend on that. God is really working in my life. And yes, maybe I didn't enjoy going around the hospital at all, but it did good to other people, and I feel now the, the reward of good works. So we realize that when we were complaining all the time, where is God? Why has he abandoned us? Where on earth is he? Why is he not there when things get difficult? The answer was, of course, that he was there hidden right inside our hearts. We realize when this gleam of sunshine comes into our life that it's during these difficult moments that we are really proving our love of God. After all, if the Christian life was always easy, if it was always a pleasure to go to Mass and a pleasure to pray and a pleasure to, get to help other people, well, then we wouldn't really be doing it for the love of God at all. We would be doing it because we enjoy it, looking after our own pleasure. But now we are struggling through doing things that are no pleasure to us. In the case of Christian works, we are obviously helping other people, but in the case of our prayer and our Mass, we can wonder what good it is doing to us or anybody else. But what we're actually proving to ourselves and to other people is that we love God. Traditionally, this sort of experience is called a period of dryness, although my metaphor began by calling it rain. When we've come through this difficult patch, struggling up the hill through the damp and the mist, we can sit back in the evening in pleasant company, in the company of the saints and say, yes, Lord, it wasn't pleasant at the time, and I wish you hadn't made me do it, but I do recognize now that I have some element of the love of God in my heart, and that must mean that God loves me. That is a marvelous realization to have. After our struggle up these bleak Pyrenees, we can relax in the knowledge of the love of God and that 
gives us and that gives us courage to continue. Of course, things don't get easier, but now we are expecting that it is going to be difficult. But it's worthwhile doing something difficult for God. Yes, we don't look forward to doing Christian work, saying our prayers, but by but, but we there is a typo here. But we know that it is worthwhile later on. We have the courage to continue with a stronger and a more mature faith in the knowledge that whenever God seems to be hiding himself, he's always right there in the temple of our heart. The same thing, of course, happened to Our Lady and St. Joseph. They took Jesus to Jerusalem for the Passover feast at the age of 12 when he became the son of the law, the Var Mitzvah. And on the way back from Jerusalem, they found that he was gone. Suddenly, all the joy had departed from their lives. They were left wondering, why has he abandoned us? Where can he be? They searched for three days, unable to find him, uh, unable to find him, unable to hear any news of him wondering what had gone wrong. What have we done wrong? Why has all the joy departed? The Gospel doesn't tell us all the details, but we can imagine them searching the countryside with the group that were heading back together and then returning to the city, trailing around the streets, around the temples, perhaps even investigating the prisons and the hospitals searching desperately and finding no joy, no pleasure, nothing but dread. They tried the bazaars, searching cheerfully up the street of the sweet sellers and looking with terror among the slave traders. St. Joseph kept having bright ideas, but each morning came and each evening with the same emptiness and desolation. And then they find him. They find him where they might have thought of looking for him first, right there in the temple all the time. The joy that reawakens when they find him is one that appreciates how much deeper their love is. Now their love has been proved. They know that they really love him. They spent three days searching for him. If they had not cared for him, they could have gone back to Nazareth, got on with their lives without him, but they cared, they loved him, and they came to understand that even despite having lost him, his love was with them all the time. It was his love that pulled them back, drew them back to the temple. So the joy that came into their hearts on finding our Lord was much greater than if they had never lost him. They realized that because of the sorrow of losing him, they valued his love all the more. Our Lady remembered then how Simon had said, A sword of sorrow will pierce your own soul too. Perhaps she wondered, is this all it's going to be? She may have thought, this is it, I have passed my test. She pondered all these things in her heart. Jesus went down and lived with them in Nazareth. Thank you for listening.